let's use our knowledge about modified virtual work to create a finite element. This will be a variational approach, an energy approach, and will replace the equilibrium ideas we used earlier. The equilibrium ideas were okay for statically determinate structures because the person could use equilibrium laws to balance the little element and actually could figure out what was going on inside. But a typical finite element with a number of nodes um, has load paths inside that are not clear to the engineer. So therefore we like to use energy methods in statically indeterminate systems. The philosophy is a lot different between this approach and the older equilibrium ideas. I'd like to give a homely analogy about that difference. If I were to use equilibrium concepts and tell a, an automobile driver how to proceed from Detroit to Chicago, I would tell very much the path involved, that you start in Detroit, you go west 180 miles on I-94, and then give a very uh, detailed path dependent uh, idea of how you go from point A to point B. The variational method is different though. You would tell the driver, well, just drive around in the United States and uh, then stop somewhere and get out of your car and walk a little south and smell the air. Do you smell stockyards? And see, that might be Chicago, okay? Then you walk west a ways from your car. Do you get out on a prairie and see uh, the beautiful plains of the Midwest? Then you go north a little bit and do you hear a football game? Perhaps Northwestern is playing a football game in Evanston. And, uh, if you go east some distance from your car, do you splash into a lake? Now, by that testing in the neighborhood of the solution, you are doing a variation. And then, if those conditions are satisfied, you say, you are in Chicago. And it's a little bit magic, a little bit like lifting yourself by your bootstraps, because uh, you presume that you know the answer, and you're testing the answer. And so you concentrate a little bit more on the dependent variables in the problem, and a little less on the independent variables in one sense. Well, in any event, we're going to follow that logic through the variational approach to creating finite elements. And we'll have a little problem session at the end. We'll start out our derivation by repeating some of these motivational ideas. Um, most finite elements really are statically indeterminate, and the energy methods really work well for these redundant structures. Also, the method generalizes rather well to nonlinear elastic problems. So there are some problems that are rather easy to handle. And uh, an interesting side effect is that the virtual work theorem emphasizes the displacement field and does a good job on predicting it, but doesn't do so well on the stress field. That's a paradox because this is probably the best and easiest method, and yet the results are not often what one would want, for instance, in mechanical engineering, which is more stress-oriented. In aerospace engineering, sometimes displacements really are important in terms of stiffnesses of stru structures under um, air loads where you might get uh, aeroelastic flexibilities that are uh, very crucial. Let's derive the stiffness matrix for a simple element that only has concentrated forces on it. Later we'll come back and look at distributed forces such as gravity. Here is a four-noted quadrilateral. I show a load at one corner and I show the three positions. I show the undeformed black body, the deformed red body at state two, and then the green virtually displaced body. We're going to use the um, assumption that the material is energy conserving and we're going to pass from an incremental approach that we used earlier into a variational approach in which we consider delta to be a variational operator that can be separated from the function on which it acts. So there will be a unique displacement field in our problem.
I like to write down the vectors and the matrices that appear in the finite element formulation in a flowchart form. On the right we have the elemental nodal coordinates signified by a Roman U and a subscript E. On the left we have the nodal forces. So those are the finite element quantities. Then um, we have the classical stress strain and field displacement in the middle. There's a vector of generalized coordinates that link those two. Some of the mappings that we've discussed already are the displacement function matrix phi that goes from the generalized coordinates to the U displacements, and those are polynomials. And then we have the H matrix, which is needed in the inverted form that relates generalized coordinates and nodal coordinates. But more often nowadays, we use the shape function as a mapping, as a primary mapping, and jump directly from the nodal displacements to the internal displacement field, signified by this italic U. And there's also a strain matrix B that will go all the way from nodal displacements to internal strain field. The D matrix is a displacement relation. It's a strain displacement and has derivatives in it. The G matrix is a material property. It's the generalized Hooke's law and would, would have a dependence on the specific material and could be orthotropic or have exotic um, anisotropies in it. So uh, we've got the mapping from one vector to another, but we are short one mapping, and that's the equilibrium one, which we would have preferred and, and which we used to use. It's as if a person were standing on one side of a desert island that had a lot of chasms on it, and there was a banana tree on the other side, and he really was hungry. So he might start trying to cross these chasms, and he would find there are convenient bridges over uh, each of the chasms until you get to the final chasm here, which unfortunately is the equilibrium chasm. And we really are not able to build a bridge there. So it's quite a paradox for this uh, hungry person to figure out how to get something to eat when he can't jump the last chasm. I'll write down the modified virtual work theorem for you here. And on the left is the work done by the external forces during a virtual displacement from state 2 to 3. Um, the next term is a change in strain energy during that same virtual displacement. This term on the left is relatively easy to handle. Below, we find that it's the change in nodal displacement times the nodal forces themselves. And that's the fundamental definition of work. It's an inner product, and so it sums over all of the nodal degrees of freedom and nodal forces. So that's relatively straightforward. But the change in strain energy is most fundamentally defined as a change in the strain energy density, which is a per unit volume energy. So you have to have the change in strain with an inner product with the stresses at the equilibrium state. That has to be integrated over the volume and then that would be the total change in strain energy. We need to discretize this right side here in that uh, we've got to convert from field variables inside the element to nodal quantities. And we already know how to do that on strain itself. It's the geometric relation B times the nodal displacements. Then if we'd like to find the virtual strain, and by that we mean the uh, change in strain that occurs with the change in the nodal displacements. It's uh, possible by using the delta as an operator on the two sides and then realizing that this delta operator acts on dependent variables, not independent variables. You're changing the answer, not the underlying problem statement. And so it doesn't affect the B matrix at all, but rather attacks only the displacements at the nodes. So that, that operator passes through the B matrix and acts on U as shown here. Then um, we take the stress definition as the um, product of the material law and the geometric law. 
and acting on the nodal displacements. Now those two quantities are crucial here in the strain energy and I'll write those in our next figure. We'll insert those two important quantities here with the change in strain on the left and the stress on the right. Now because the change in strain occurs in transpose form, it, a transpose of a product is the product of the transposes in reversed order. And that's why the delta U is on the left side of the B matrix. But furthermore, the nodal displacements U and delta U are not functions of the underlying coordinates x, y, z, and so they're not affected by the volume integration. They appear to be constants in this calculation, and so you can bring them outside. So we do that. We bring both those two terms outside, as shown in the next figure. Then we use the additive and multiplicative property of matrices and the fact that that's distributive to sum the terms in this way and then carrying the remainder terms in this um, large set of parentheses. Now is when we will convert from a scalar concept to a vector concept. And the logic is this, that here we have a row vector times a column vector. And uh, when the inner product is taken, which is a scalar product, there's only one term there, like six inch pounds of energy or, or 12 uh, Newton meters or whatever, uh, to be zero. But the trick is that this is an arbitrary displacement. Uh, and so as the driver of the car, when he was in Chicago, had to do, he had to get out and walk around the car, north, south, east, and west. Likewise, in a structure, you must vary the different coordinates in the element and to ensure then that this vector in parentheses is is orthogonal to all possible changes in the node positions the only way that can happen is if the quantity in parentheses is itself zero and so you bring you bring the argument from a scalar one to a vector one because of the arbitrariness of that one uh, pre-multiplying vector. And that then recovers what is really an equilibrium law here and is a vector law. And we identify immediately that what we'd like to call a stiffness is this integral. And that indeed is the finite element stiffness matrix and uh, summarized in the equation of equilibrium below. This is very compact and works for a wide variety of elements. I think it's really interesting that the finite element derivation, which is so powerful on the previous two slides, only took 10 lines of equations. And of course we had the background of the modified virtual work theorem uh, in preparation for us. But it's a very powerful uh, technology and, and so general, so it's very important to understand that. Now, as we look at this uh, island again, what we find is that in that expression, which I've repeated here, you involve one of the bridges twice. You take the geometric law and it's symmetrically disposed about the material law. Kind of as if the man had uh, jumped over this nice strain bridge, over the material bridge, jumped back over on the, um, this geometric law, and found himself standing here at the beginning with a banana in his hand. And so he got the uh, full value of having made it all the way to the banana tree. And indeed, we're able to fi fix up then the system behavior of this system without ever uh, directly closing the one gap. And we've used energy to do so. So that's the magic of a variational process. Now when you do actual calculations, it's important to have different versions of that calculation available involving these different bridges. And uh, the most common form would be the second one here where we use the shape function and then the 
uh, strain displacement law in separated form, at least at the outset, because many people would start the whole derivation with the assumption of the shape function. Another form which I thought had died out, but which is still interesting to some people, is this bottom form where the H matrix is separated out and indeed can be factored out of the inside of the matrix because it's a matrix of constants, leaving the variables shown. This has come up to be useful in a recent derivation of what's called geometric shape sensitivities. And I was just uh, amazed when I saw that. This was originally the old-fashioned way of doing the problem with the displacement functions assumed first, uh, then the mapping H found, all the inversion, and so on. And there was a form called Argyris' uh, natural coordinates that makes use of this form. Well, that finishes the derivation of stiffness for, it, for a typical element. Now we need to go back and look at how to handle distributed loads. In this case, you can have volumetric, surface, and line loads. And I show those on this fat little potato over here. The uh, surface loads would be given the symbol T for traction, L for line loads likewise, and this X for volumetric loads. And gravity would be the biggest example of a volumetric load. Pressure would be the biggest example of a surface load. And line loads come up more typically on beams. So uh, I've included that uh, as a subcase. How can we redistribute these distributed loads and make them appear as concentrated loads at isolated grid points? That has been um, um, a general interesting problem in finite elements, uh, not so much just for static loads, which we'll do here, but also for inertial and damping loads. So there are, there are other cases um, lurking in the, in the uh, weeds, you might say. Now, we're going to again use the modified virtual work theorem, which works out beautifully on this. And we'll repeat the previous derivation um, and then add the external force terms. I will hurry through the strain energy part of the problem since we've spent time on that earlier. I'm going to write down the modified virtual work theorem again, but include the work done by external distributed forces. And they appear here, here, and here for the line surface attractions and volumetric forces, respectively. In each case, you'll notice that the distributed force acts through a change in displacement in the interior of the body. And the, the dimensions are such that when you uh, do this calculation, it's an amount of work done per running length of line. So you integrate up on the line length. Here you get a surface uh, effect where there's an amount of work done per unit area and you integrate on per unit area. And lastly, the third volumetric force is integrated over the volume. We have already worked out the contribution here in the change of strain energy over the volume. So our biggest task now is to discretize and convert that from um, integrals over the interior of the element into quantities happening at the nodes. The, the shape function is our biggest tool for that. So the internal displacement field can be interpolated in terms of variations in the nodes themselves. And as we saw before in our original derivation, the transpose of a product is the product of transposes in reversed order. So when we want this term to appear, uh, it will bring the delta u out front in every case in that um, integral form, and then we can factor that out from the integral. We'll use the fact that the multiplication and addition um, are distributive, and we'll gather the terms as shown. We now have a shape function appearing in these distributed work terms, and also appears in the stiffness, by the way, hidden in the B matrix. So this entire um, exercise really depends on the interpolation of the internal displacement field.
we now use that same argument again about the fact that these are arbitrary virtual displacements and the only way that the term in large parentheses can cause a zero energy under uh, an inner product with an arbitrary vector is that the quantity in parentheses itself must be zero in a vectorial sense. We can identify in that equation the contribution made by the stiffness matrix as we did before and then we can identify the contributions of each of the external distributed forces. We have the line, surface, and volume forces. So um, the quantity in large parentheses is brought out and made to stand alone as an equilibrium vector law that I'll write here. I'll separate out the stiffness term on the left and put all of the force-like terms on the right. And um, the original concentrated forces, F, appear standing alone, and then we get these inner products for the others. We will give a new symbol for these called equivalent nodal loads um, for the original loading of interest, the line, the traction, the volumetric loads. And from that point on, we can bring these equivalent nodal loads into play. These um, quantities that I'm putting in square boxes here are the ones that are automatically done by computer codes for the user. So luckily, if your loading is of a rather standard form, such as constant pressure and often linear, linearly varying pressure, then you will uh, have the help from the computer code to put that in for you. In the bottom, I have shown a typical continuous body with finite element nodes on it, which then might form a, an element itself. There's some patch that has, in this case, a surface load. And of course, what we're doing is a replacement idea. We are replacing the pressure on that surface with these concentrated forces over here, which are then called equivalent nodal loads. Some people would call those um, equivalent work loads or work equivalent loads. Well, you might think that we've finished our work now, that we understand distributed loads. But there really is another category of initial effects that are due to initial strain and initial stress. And um, these are so useful in thermal problems and in nonlinear problems that I'd like to solve that issue now also. This will be called a derivation for initial stress and strain. And of the two, the pre-strain is actually more important because of its use in the thermal problem. It's possible, it turns out, to treat a temperature field on a body as if the body had instead had a mechanical strain. And that's what we will prove in detail here. Um, also, in nonlinear cases, it's used as an artifice to account for either material or geometric nonlinearities. And pre-stress is used in that artificial way also. Now, what we're going to do is re redo the derivation, and we're going to generalize the stress-strain law this time to include an initial strain and an initial stress. And I know this isn't too motivated, although at the early um, start of the virtual work discussion, I did show that the stress-strain law might be biased in this way in general. So actually, you have seen uh, one reference to this without any motivation at the time. Now we know that these are actually very useful in practical cases, and especially in thermal problems, in uh, thermal stress problems. Okay. Well, we still have the general idea that the change in strain energy is the change in strain times the full stress at equilibrium. And now we just expand that, having a more general view of what stress is, and we put it in this uh, parenthetical quantity here. Um, again, the transpose will allow the delta U to be brought out front.
in this derivation, the pre-stress and pre-strain are going to affect the um, variation of strain energy, not the external loads. So um, I'll work hardest on that strain energy term. Here we have the change in strain energy that would include the previous term which had to do with the variation in displacements, but now it also has a term regard to variation of this um, initial strain entering in. It really goes along for the ride in the energy calculation, and then the stress also goes along for the ride. So these work-like terms are interesting because you get a change in the um, here is a change in the nodal displacement, and then you get these various terms that ride along at state two, at the equilibrium or balanced position of the body. And this is the conventional linear elastic term, and then our pre-strain and pre-stress terms. Now, if we um, just combine this information with our previous energy statement, which was the virtual, modified virtual work statement, then we get this longer form. And I'm now identifying the quantities in here as being quantities with uh, a new purpose here, the equivalent nodal load due to pre-strain and pre-stress. There's a sign convention that goes along with these. By the time you put these terms on the other side of the equation from the uh, stiffness term, then the signs are changed so that we do get a, this uh, minus sign cancels on this term, but we will get a minus sign on the stress term shown here. We've certainly done a lot of good work to this point. We've developed the element stiffness, and we've done a lot of work on equivalent nodal loads. I'd like to make some comments here, primarily about the equivalent nodal loads. First of all, we have developed five equivalent nodal load types. That's a lot. We have a lot of power there. And these equivalent nodal loads have been implemented in most commercial codes for many kinds of volumetric surface line and thermal loads such that if the user inputs a certain temperature field at the grid points, then the code will automatically figure out the equivalent nodal loads that, that go with that temperature field. Likewise with the other forces. Civil engineering codes will often automatically give you pressure equivalent nodal loads on a surface if the pressure is either constant or linear with a dimension. And the reason being there that dams and other bodies exposed to hydrostatic forces often have linearly varying pressures on the face of a surface. Now, it's good that this happens, that the codes have implemented this help for the user, because the older way of doing lumped loads is starting to get tough when we get to the higher order finite elements. It's not much trouble when you have two nodes on a side and the redistribution is somewhat along linear ideas. But when you have what are called parabolic elements with three nodes on a side, then the shape functions become more exotic. And the actual work equivalent loads sometimes even go in the opposite direction that you might think. So it's not so obvious. And it is therefore good that the codes are doing this for you. I've used the word work equivalent loads now, and some people prefer that term. Pre-strain has become used quite a bit, and primarily because of thermal stress problems, uh, more so than pre-stress. And lastly, it's probably wise modeling practice to put your mid-side nodes literally at the middle point of a side on a finite element. And the reason being that codes in the past have sometimes taken a shortcut and have assumed that that's where the node is, and they don't really do the integration involved, but only have done it in a general sense, perhaps with what amounts to a Simpson's rule, assuming equally spaced nodes, you see. So you would be a little bit more bulletproof if you do literally put mid-side nodes at the mid-side if you want to avoid that possibility. Now, I don't know of major codes nowadays that have made that assumption. 
uh, the last element that I know of in uh, one of the major codes was taken out on the order of two, two or three years ago uh, where that kind of an assumption was made. But nevertheless, I think it, for the near future, it would be wise modeling practice. It is helpful now to apply our new theory to the simplest finite element that one can use, which is the truss element or line element. Here is a two-noted truss, and it has only axial displacements and axial forces. And um, we'll look at the tension compression characteristics of this body. One of the forms for a stiffness that we found involve the shape function. So this is a handy form for us to look at. And then the equivalent nodal loads for this element would involve really only line loads because um, lateral loads, there are other moments and, and uh, volume loads and other things don't make much sense in this problem. So here's a candidate line load that I'm showing below and we'll try to find the equivalent nodal loads for that. It's a triangular distribution. But remember that that is a distribution of forces along the axis, and so you have to actually show them in the following form where I'm, they are increasing along the axis like this. And then Unfortunately, a person has to plot this to be meaningful in a non-physical context like this. So don't be deceived by the direction of the uh, figure below that those loads are really axial loads. Now, the heart of all of our calculations is based on the shape function approach. So it's indeed how do you interpolate what goes on in the interior of the element from knowledge of what happens at the nodes. These shape functions that we have dealt with so much now come to our rescue. Um, N1 here is the shape function with a unit value at the first node and zero at the second. And N2 is the converse, going zero to one. Um, we figured these out before, and they're also quite easy to calculate um, just by um, the equation of a straight line. So we can explicitly write those out for our problem, showing how each of the nodal displacements um, affects the internal displacement field in the problem, and giving us this field displacement. Fortunately, this little element is simple, and so the internal workings are all one-dimensional. So for one-dimensional elasticity, it's rather easy to say that the stress is related to the strain through Young's modulus only, and that the strain displacement law is um, given by this derivative. So previously, we had general symbols for these uh, matrix quantities, for instance, the generalized Hooke's law now becomes just Young's modulus, and the strain displacement law becomes just this simple derivative. So we start out by finding the strain matrix B, which was defined to be the strain displacement law times the shape functions. And I've rewritten that here where the strain displacement law is the derivative. The shape functions we showed in the previous slide are linear functions of X. And when you take the derivative, you get these constants in the strain law. And then you would call this a constant strain element. We'll do the stiffness calculation first. Our stiffness um, now can be formed from the BGB law, and we can put in those constant strain mappings that we just found. We bring in the Young's modulus for the material law, the generalized Hooke's law. Now, matrix products like this can be done in any order, so we'll multiply out the back two matrices where the one-by-one one matrix just becomes a constant multiplying in. Then um, we have this interesting, very interesting 
product of matrices. And for some of you, this may be the first time you've seen such a strange situation because this matrix um, on the left is uh, one row and, let's see, it's two rows and one column. It's a two by one. And the one on the right is a one by two. Now, in order to be able to do that multiplication, you have to have conforming uh, matrices, and that means that the um, terms that are summed over have to have the same number of terms, and that, that is true. Then you remain with the number of rows from the first matrix and the number of columns from the second in your product form, which we get below here, and so indeed we get a two by two matrix. So now you are actually expanding the size of your matrices by that multiplication. People who are a little rusty on matrix multiplication should uh, gradually work with this and you'll become comfortable with it after a while. You can use a summation form also if you feel that you're getting into trouble and sometimes that's an alternate way to look at it. But in any event, row here times column here will yield this first term and then likewise row here times column here yields the second term and so on. And you fill out this integrand. Now, it turns out that the integral of a matrix is the same as the matrix uh, with the integrals taken term by term. That's not obvious, but it, it shows how placid the integral operator is and the matrix operator or the matrix notation because they can be interchanged in that way. And so now you have to integrate these quantities at an element level. That's pretty simple because those are all constant integrands and they just multiply up, uh, bringing up a length scale when you do the integration. Well, the result of that operation is a matrix that turns out to be the same as the one that we got earlier from equilibrium ideas in our second lecture of this series. Here it is. EA over L is a common term with pluses and minuses, which is more obvious in the second version. And so we are, have been successful to use an energy method, and when we can compare, we get the same answer as equilibrium. Of course, our real thrust here is that we can use the energy method even when you cannot get the element by equilibrium, but here we're able to compare. Okay, now our next big idea is to get the equivalent nodal loads. And that involved the inner product of the shape function matrix shown here with the line load here. Again, you have multiplication of, uh, quanti of matrix quantities that aren't quite obvious. It's two rows and one column times a one vector. Sometimes you might think of it as a one by one uh, matrix, but let's call it a one vector. And then you have to have um, conformability in the sense that the number of columns on the first matrix has to be the same as the rows in the second, and you end up with a two vector when you've done that multiplication. That's done by this term times this, which I write and factor out the uh, scale of the loading, leaving this polynomial, and then this term times this to give the second term. Let's again call on the fact that an integral of a matrix quantity can be done term by term and we'll bring the integration into the matrix symbol. And here we have, for instance, the uh, integration inside on that term and on that term. So you have to be able to integrate linear terms and quadratic terms in X uh, leading to these expressions uh, without worrying you about the details, this will integrate out to give these values of L over 6 and L over 3. But it's more convenient to rearrange the answer by factoring out terms such that you have the total load appearing on the left here and then showing that one-third of it acts at the left node and two-thirds at the right node. And I've sketched that over here. Now some of you might say, well I could have guessed that because my intuition would tell me that in some sense two-thirds of the load should go to the right. 
And what you may be dealing with is memories of handling beam problems with lateral loadings. And actually, that intuition is not relevant to this problem. This is a statically indeterminate problem, and either node could have carried the entire live load uh, and kept the body in equilibrium. It's only an energy idea that for the linear shape functions, um, you can redistribute the loads in this way and then get the same energy through those shape functions as the original triangular loading would have done. Let me review, though, what your intuition from the beam problem is, just to expand on this a little bit. That um, if you had lateral loading on a beam and it went to the side like this, and you actually showed as such, you know that the center of pressure on the beam would be at the, uh, basically the center of area of that loading pattern. And then because of moment equilibrium, you would say that two-thirds of the reaction force would be at the right and one-third at the left. And that's a good concept, and it's a linear concept. It happens to agree with the current um, uh, example by accident, though. We don't have moment equilibrium that requires that kind of a predetermined balance of forces. But rather, in our case, it's just the energy equivalence. Now, you get the same answer because the shape functions are linear, and the moment balance that you were doing in your mind in the beam problem was also a linear process with distance. So the two answers came out the same. But if you want to push your um, luck a little further and you think, well, I can see the answer, then consider a three-noted truss and you would find then that it's quite difficult to decide how to redistribute a, a load, even a constant load. It's very difficult to decide how to redistribute. And um, so the equivalent nodal load concept is very powerful and based on this uh, work equivalence, which is uh, not intuitive for the um, average complicated situation. Now it's time for a problem session. Some of you might wonder about these problem sessions. Where do these problems come from? Uh, some of them were developed to prove a point in class as an example, and many of them were developed for exams. So you'll find many of these questions, such as the first one that we're going to do, were originally meant to be exam questions and requiring about 15 minutes of a, uh, of a student's time. The first problem is a constant strain triangle, and just to make people think about the interpolation process, I'm saying that the triangle moves through a distance at the lower left node of one unit um, in the direction to the right. And that would lead to a final uh, shape of the element, which would have straight sides, uh, of this bunched up triangle shown here. And the problem is to find the strain in the inside of the element. This really is a matter of interpolation, so we have to get serious about how the shape function will propagate that disturbance at the node into the interior of the element. So our shape function for this particular problem uh, for the first node would be taken to be a constant times the equation for the line or the surface that would pass through these two nodes over here. So really, as you know, the equation of this line would be a function could be written originally as y equals f of x. But with some work, you can find out that this is the formulation. In fact, y equals the y-intercept, which is b, and then minus the slope, which is going to be uh, b over a times x. And then if we non-dimensionalize this, let's see, we can take divide through by b, and then you'll get this equation. All right, how do we evaluate that constant? We do it by setting the displacement at the 
node number one to be unity and evaluate the x and y at the origin, which is zero. So you get just that the constant times one has to equal one, or in other words, the constant itself is one. So we know what our shape function is. It's merely this quantity here. The non-dimensionalization that I did actually forced it into the proper form. And what we really need is the strain law B, which is the strain displacement law times the shape function. I'm going to use summation form to help in this problem because I can identify that there are a lot of zeros involved and uh, it will help organize the problem and focus our attention on the variables that we do want. So in summation form, the general ith component of strain has to be related to the strain displacement law times the shape function times the nodal vector. And notice that in each case in that multiplication you're summing over a common index. So that J would be the index representing the column of the D matrix but the row of the N matrix. And K likewise plays that role in this multiplication. We really are only interested in one strain. We've been asked to provide epsilon x, which would carry the index 1. And so we only want um, i equals 1, which will limit there. And I've, I've shown that on the left side here. But that also implies that we only want i to be 1 in the D matrix then we only are given a displacement in the U1 component and not the other five components. So we're only interested in U1 for the displacement over here. Now that's the K index. So, and furthermore, the specific value is unity. So I can go ahead and put that in. But that drives this K index to take only the value of unity. That means we've effectively summed out the K index, and the only one that's of interest remains. So K really was only summed over 1, and the summation here then turned out to be degenerate. If you write out the D and the N matrices, they appear as shown here, and I'm anticipating what's going to happen in this multiplication, that I only need the first row of the D matrix, namely this row. I only need the first column of the N matrix, which is this column. And then the summation proceeds on, there are only two terms involved, from the J index to be 1 and 2. Now what that means is you, you take across this direction, multiply down this direction. And note again, you're going to get a partial on x of this polynomial, and then 0 times 0 over here. So it reduces only to one term. I'll write down the surviving terms in our strain expression. Here we see that we have the role of the geometric strain displacement law and the geometric shape function. The derivative kills off the terms except for the one coming from the x over a, and you get a constant strain over the face of the element in the x direction with a negative value, so it's a compression. That makes sense because what you've done now is taken an original triangle such as this, you've moved a node that has made the left end shorten um, the horizontal lines that are extended across here. It's not quite um, intuitive that you would get constant straining from bottom to top. You might have thought that this would compress the bottom proportionally more than the elements at the top, but you see this is a straight-sided element and that compresses all of them uniformly. If you followed this problem through, you would find that there's no strain epsilon y throughout the body, but that there is a shear strain, as you can imagine here, because you're distorting angles. But I think the person who's done a lot of stress analysis would be a little um, uneasy about the fact that this 
displacement in the horizontal direction causes no strain in the vertical direction, no epsilon y. Because you're used to the coupling through the material law that would give a Poisson ratio effect, that you might get forces up there in the, in the transverse direction to the direction of load. That's partly correct, that force-like things can be uh, coupled, but this is purely a geometric argument we've gone through. And so at the level of nodal displacements and interpolating the um, displacement field and the strain field inside the body, you don't get any material coupling at all. Problem two will be an exercise on equivalent nodal loads. I've picked two of the hardest cases I can think of that will test your ingenuity, and one is a distributed load over part of the body, and the second is a concentrated force in the interior between the nodes. So it's really not clear intuitively how to redistribute such a load pattern, and, and would be difficult by older-fashioned lump load ideas. But we will be able to make consistent loading here that will cause the same work as the original distributed load would have. Um, the dimensions on the loading are force per length on the uh, left problem, and on the right, the dimensions are force. Now, we haven't yet spoken about the Dirac delta function, which is useful to handle these concentrated forces. So I'll have to say just a little about it. The Dirac delta is a hypothetical function that takes an infinite value over some special point. Let's call that point x0. But yet the delta function um, is integrable, and in fact the area under the curve turns out to be unity. A further refinement is that the delta function is not considered just one such function, but rather the limit as this figure gets sharper and sharper and narrower and narrower until at the limit you have just an extremely tall spike at the point of question x0. So it's possible then to take such a function, the delta function, and multiply it times some distributed function, such as f of x, putting it in here, and then you will find that it will evaluate that function at, indeed, rather than a unit value, at f at x0. Some of you may not be comfortable with this if you haven't seen it in a physics problem. And I do say more about this in the chapter on classical plate theory where concentrated forces are really important. So uh, you can look ahead to that if need be. We'll start with the solution for the distributed load shown in the left figure on the previous slide. And what most engineers forget at some point in their career is that you can have functions that are zero over a part of a, in a region and then non-zero over the other part. And when you're asked to integrate that function then, all you have to do is bring the limits up to knock out the parts where the function is zero. Often that's easier than drawing some kind of a strange function in here that uh, does in fact have zero values over a region you're interested in. So you take the full value of the distributed load and you account for the fact that it's zero outside of that region of interest by not integrating it over that region outside of your interest. So, so our limits on the integral are L over 2 to L. And under that philosophy then it's pretty easy to uh, carry out the integration. You take this constant term which will factor out front. You do integration term by term in this vector and uh, evaluate at the limit points, and you'll get this expression here. In the ratio of distribution that one part of the load goes to the left and three parts go to the right. So this load here, as originally conceived, is redistributed to the nodes as shown 
below in the ratio of three parts to one part. And um, I guess, again, we could do that intuitive discussion about whether that appears to satisfy uh, somewhat of a balance with regard to the center of pressure here, and it again does because we have linear shape functions in this problem, but again, that's just a fortuitous coincidence and uh, doesn't reflect any real physics. But nevertheless, these are intuitive in, in this case. Now let's do the second equivalent nodal load problem that had the concentrated force. And this time we will, in fact, integrate over the total region of the problem and we'll make the function itself bear the burden of going to zero in the non-interesting regions. So we use the Dirac delta function here and times the constant and times this shape function. Selectively, that integral, in fact, then will evaluate the function at the point in this case, which is two-thirds of the way across the truss element. And so delta of this quantity uh, will, in fact, make us evaluate x at two-thirds L. And when that's done, you end up with this distribution below where the load now is being redistributed in the form two-thirds at the right side, one-third at the left side. And I think that, again, is intuitive because since this was two-thirds of the way to the right end, that seems like a logical way to do it. But again, uh, is, is being done on the basis of an energy balance and not some sort of force balance. Problem three concerns the hypothetical element that might be formed from some given data. Here I'm proposing that you have a mapping matrix H inverse as given, a displacement function matrix shown here, a strain displacement law, and a material law. Now this is meant to be really hypothetical, but as we go along we might have some clue as to what sort of an element this was. The strain displacement law is interesting because it, it shows that you only get strains in the x direction, and yet the phi matrix shows that you have a body that has both y and, and x coordinates. So it seems to be a body lying in two dimensions that has probably three degrees of freedom, which is a little strange, and uh, has a material law which is similar to an elastic body where, where stress will be proportional to strain. So what kind of an element is this? Uh, we'll assume that the initial volume of the element is V0, that is the uh, undeformed volume, and the question is to find the stiffness matrix and then to comment on that when we get done as to whether or not there might be a rigid body mode present. And that means would there be one of the degrees of freedom perhaps that is degenerate and doesn't contribute any stiffness. Well, this problem has been posed in a mysterious way, and so it's going to be fair for us to use any kind of treachery that we can to solve it. First of all, it appears there are three degrees of freedom because the H matrix is a three by three matrix. We see that the X and Y are involved. We suspect there would be a scalar field with three nodes rather than a vector field with, say, two nodes and one degree of freedom at one node and two at the other. So that would be a somewhat of an odd element, although we already have our suspicions about this one. It appears that there's a rigid body mode already from looking at the phi matrix that has a constant term. That means one of the generalized coordinates will allow the, the field variable to take a uh, constantly elevated value over the body. It's not completely obvious yet what all that implies, but we'll come back to that and we can show that more definitely later on. The 
shape function matrix is the first thing we need now if we want to start to develop our stiffness matrix, which will be going in this logic from here on, that uh, we multiply the phi matrix times H inverse. That's an easy forward multiplication done here and yields this shape function matrix. So it's uh, fully populated with X and Y terms. Next, we'd like to calculate the strain matrix, and that's just the strain displacement law times the shape function matrix. Well, that derivative kills off one of the terms and gives us constant values on the other. So this is a constant strain, although we don't know quite what we mean by strain in this problem at this time. And also adds further suspicion that we will have a rigid body mode because one of the uh, motions of this body has led to something that causes no strain. Then the stiffness matrix can be written out in the general form with the B matrix. We can substitute our specific B matrix in as a, in this case, a, uh, a column vector, and then on this case as a row vector, and with our Q material properties. We do the multiplication of the latter two matrices first to get this intermediate result. And then we're at that position again where we're taking a three by one matrix times a one by three matrix. And this will expand and give us a three by three matrix shown in the next figure. So we expand the integrand and get the three by three matrix there. And then that can be integrated term by term to yield the final stiffness matrix. In this form, you can see that the first coordinate would be an unusual one in that it doesn't have any stiffness and it doesn't couple with the other coordinates in any elastic way, so it's elastically uncoupled. And that's further illustration that there is something like a rigid body motion in this structure. It, um, it would be hard to imagine how one coordinate could be so thoroughly uncoupled. It's almost as if it's a uh, grid point singularity in this case. We talk about things like that later. And by the way, rigid body effects like that are common in other physical systems such as in electrical circuits where you can get a DC voltage shift uh, in an AC circuit. And of course, uh, good practice is to ground that DC voltage so that you don't get the voltage drifting around. And the same thing could happen in a temperature field. Now, um, that's the end of our problem solution, but I do give a little hint as to how I laid the problem out with the secret geometry that I used in working out some of the geometric ideas. So uh, behind this uh, mysterious element was indeed a geometry as shown below. The fourth problem will be a study of an isosceles plane stress triangle and we will work out the ideas of shape functions and equivalent nodal loads. It's actually a pretty long problem. It's almost like a case study. Here's the triangle. It has an interior node number four. And the questions that I'm going to ask have to do with are the shape functions linear or not and why? Find the simplest set of shape functions. What are the equivalent nodal loads at node three, say, for a constant body force in the x direction? which would be a surface force in this case. And then finally, is this a conforming element with neighboring elements? Can you say anything about that? The solution to part A in our problem has to do with counting the number of degrees of freedom and then the number of terms in a polynomial to see if it can be done with just a complete linear polynomial. The argument really comes more from the displacement function phi approach rather than the shape function. 
And what happens is you find that there are four degrees of freedom in the problem representing uh, a displacement, say, in the x direction at the four nodes. Uh, yet a linear polynomial in two dimensions only has three coefficients, so there's no way that you can create a displacement polynomial to um, effectively control four nodes with only three coefficients. So you're going to need at least one quadratic form. And uh, that might be an xy term or an x squared or a y squared. At this point, you don't know until you look at the um, polynomials uh, for the specific shape functions. You'd prefer it to be geometrically isotropic, of course, and involve xy uh, in preference to the others. But you could get both x squared and y squared. There's no guarantee when you go to shape functions that you are as well controlled as you are with the displacement polynomial formulation. Nevertheless, we go ahead with our shape function ideas in part b. And I'm going to use the product idea that the shape function representing node 1, to take a unit value here, will be the product of a surface that passes through these vertical lines that, that knock out the displacement at uh, nodes 2, 3, and 4. And the product of those lines is this x times x minus a with an arbitrary adjustable coefficient c. If you evaluate that to be unity at the left end, at the uh, node number 1, you put in the values for x here and here, and you come up with an expression that evaluates c as 1 over 2a squared. And that appears as a normalizing factor in the first shape function. The shape function for node 2 on the far side is identical in logic, and you only come up with x plus a there instead of x minus a. So there's a kind of a symmetry of that shape function. The third shape function is obtained by similar arguments. Here we want a unit value at the upper vertex, and we'll take a product form with the equation for the two green lines shown below, and causing this product with the coefficient c to be determined. And again, that's evaluated at the vertex with a uh, unit value, and you put in the b values where, in this case, y is taken to be b. You get a normalizing factor and apply that for this shape function. Now we're left only with the shape function for the central node. And that's found by the product rule by the horizontal green lines. And again, we have these two functions. Adjust the coefficient and get this fourth one. Now the process we're doing is not unique. You can get, get different polynomial forms if you're willing to have more fancy surfaces. But these uh, shape functions that you have just seen develop don't involve more than quadratic forms. They actually do have y squared terms. They have uh, x squared terms. Um, looking back at them, I don't see any xy term in it. So um, they've turned out to have a particular form, but it is a quadratic set of polynomials. And we can put those into a shape function matrix below here so that we know everything about the problem in the geometric sense. Part C of our problem has to do with calculating equivalent nodal loads at the top vertex due to a uniform horizontal traction across the face of the triangle. So the sketch shows here what we uh, are interested in, this horizontal force, call it a Tx, and then the required force um, uh, replacements, F5 and F6. So that's going to involve an integration over the area of the body of this surface traction and the shape functions that we just developed are the major ingredient here. I'm going to um, go into the summation convention here to help eliminate some of these terms rather than write them all out. Now, 
if I is the free index indicating which of the force components we're getting, then that appears in the shape function here and in a in a free index way. So it's not summed over. But the the J index, which is the component of traction, uh, is being summed over and go takes the values one and two. Now the only thing is that the T2 component here, which is the Y component, is actually zero. So we don't need to do that sum on the J here, but rather just set it to be unity. And so that knocks out the summation in effect, and we'll only need N1I and T1 as a result. So our um, form has reduced to this form below here. Then we can substitute in the values for the free index of the horizontal component F5 related to N15 and, and the Tx or the T1 component. And then F6 is a vertical component times N16 times Tx again. Now this is going to vanish in a second because this component is zero, but uh, I'm just previewing the results a little there. I'll write down the shape function and include only the relevant terms. Here we have the component N15 and here's the component N16, which is zero. We're interested in the horizontal component and the vertical component at this upper node. So starting with the horizontal component, we put in uh, for the free index the 5. And um, in here we have the shape function uh, term n15. And then this is constant. That can be integrated over the face of the element. And by the way, that integration isn't trivial because with those slanted sides, you need to do a careful adjustment of the upper and lower limits on these integrals. I found that that fools many people in the field and many of our graduate students forget about integrating over a non-rectangular domain. Everybody can do a rectangle, but to do a triangle is uh, tougher. But in any event, you evaluate that integral and you come up with this force acting at the um, upper node in the right direction. And um, through some work I've done subsequent to this, I've found that uh, that's actually a twelfth of the total force in the horizontal direction. And so it's really a, a fairly small fraction of the total force that that triangle is exposed to. Meanwhile, the vertical component, F6, would use the shape function N16, which would have occurred in this location, replacing uh, this shape function, and then we would have F6 on the left side, and that vanishes. So the horizontal force doesn't cause any uh, equivalent nodal load in the vertical direction. And when completing the whole set of equivalent nodal loads, I was astounded to find that 9 twelfths of it acts at the center of the element and only 1 twelfth out at the uh, nodes at the periphery. So this is one of those non-intuitive situations where a higher order element, namely a quadratic field inside, distributes the forces in a way that is not intuitive and in no way could people have just guessed this answer. Part D of our problem had to do with whether the element would be conforming or not. And the answer to that involves um, kind of an end run, we say in football notation in the United States, that uh, you have to think about what would control the deflections on the edge of an element. And you'd like that control to be common between element A and B that adjoin that edge, so that both elements use the same information to calculate whether that edge is a straight line or bows to the right or bows to the left. Unfortunately, in our element, if we take the, um, say, this upper left side, uh, that a cut along that side you would find, if you look at the shape functions, will be parabolic. It will have 
quadratic terms and in general then could take a, a fancy shape. But unfortunately, you only have two pieces of information from the nodes that lie on that line. And therefore, in order to uniquely prescribe what goes on on that cut edge, you must use information either from the mid-side